Hey everybody, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to my Sunday live streams where we talk about photography and catch up on how everybody's doing. I really like to think of this as a community meetup or photo club meetup that we can kind of meet here virtually and, and uh, share, share our thoughts and ideas and opinions about what's going on in photography, whether it's, uh, you know, trends or gear or what have you. And I also like to always uh, tell you guys um, uh, what I've been up to. And uh, I'm a little bit under the weather. And I caught this cold, I think, when I went to the hospital the other day or Wednesday. So I'm getting over it now, but my nose is still a little bit stuffy and runny. So if I look a little bit off today, uh, that's part of it. <laughs> Plus some some other issues that I mentioned last week in my stream that still is kind of unresolved, but uh, not nothing serious at this time. So that's that's good news. Everything on paper looks really good, but you know when something feels off, something is off, right? So I'll I'll keep you guys posted on that. Um, I really appreciate the kind words and emails I've gotten, uh, <clears throat> but like I said, I think. I'm a picture of health on paper, but I really, I really want to figure out what what this other issue is, <clears throat> or if it's just getting old. I don't know, man. Just getting old sucks. Time is a bitch. Oh, so anyway, yes. Happy Sunday. Good to see you, Seraphin and Roberto. Always good to see you, Bob O'Neill, Roger. Alamati and Robin Schaefer, Wayne Cox, John Thomas, Lysippus, Jeff Painter. Man, you guys are awesome. It's great seeing you guys here every week and coming back and, and to join me and, and participate in the stream because that's what really makes the community, right? Is people coming together and participating. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons uh, I really love going out with the uh, photo clubs uh, with David Crooks. He he went out. Uh, he won't be here today in the stream. He went out to uh, photograph. Um, what do you call those things? Cars, <laughs> but not not. I know what cars are, but what I'm saying is like uh, drift drifting. That's what it is. Where these cars go around this track and and you know go sideways. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a little bit too far away for me. Um, I think it's at least an hour and a half to two hour drive, which isn't bad, but I just, and, and plus it costs like 20 to 20, $20 to go. And, uh, you know, I'm just not, I'm just, I spent all my money on stupid stuff. So I don't really have a lot to spare <laughs> for, but anyway, uh, but yeah, hopefully I'll see some pictures that they took and they, they should be awesome. Uh, Alan Hedge, good to see you. And uh, Michael, good to see you. Um, just a couple of questions up already. Let me let me just get right into it, I guess. Let me see. How do I bring these up? Uh, close this window. Open this one up. There we go. <clears throat> so right off the bat, Darko. Darko had a question here. Uh, it says, my counterpart wants to buy an EM1 Mark III. What would you say is a good used price? Well, I'm seeing them everywhere for about a thousand, but I think if you can get closer to eight hundred, that would be an awesome price, no brainer. Uh, if you pay a thousand, make sure you get one in near mint condition. Uh, that's that's where I would go with that. Awesome camera. It's funny, you know. Another friend of mine is looking at a smaller, lighter camera because uh, she shoots with a Nikon D3, and you know that's a double grip, you know, DSLR monster from the last century, right? <laughs> Great camera, but she took it on travel out to France. And uh, when she got back, she was like, you know, this is just too much, right? So I get it. So I'm going to go out with her hopefully today, assuming I'm still feeling, you know, like this, uh, to uh, show her the EM5 Mark II, because her budget is like less than $1,000. So what are you going to get for a thousand dollars that has lenses and good features, right? Uh, the M5 Mark II, you know, you can buy those for about four hundred, and you can get a couple lenses for another four or five hundred. So you're well under a thousand dollars, and you you flushed out a nice little kit, I think. 
Uh, and it's weather sealed, has the live comp, which I know she'll enjoy because we did some of that together before. Um, you know, focus stacking. And I think, uh, I'm sorry, bracketing. I think it has focus stacking too. It was in a firmware update. I'll have to double check that. But uh, <clears throat> so she'll really enjoy it. And of course, we know the image quality for micro four thirds is sufficient. But it was interesting to hear her comments about she doesn't know if she could live with a non-professional camera because she'd been shooting the D3. And uh, I told her I switched from Nikon D750 to EM10 Mark II, <laughs> you know, in a very short period of time. I mean, it didn't take me long to realize how good the Micro Four Thirds system is. And uh, partially what kind of spawned this channel uh, was, or or the content on this channel was, because Micro Four Thirds was is was or is such a such a great system and and offers anything any photographer could possibly want. Um, all right, so that's one. Uh, let's see. And uh, sorry, while I'm going down, I'll I'll move around a little bit because it looks like I'm so good at sitting still, right? Because I do a lot of self portraits, and I I, I did an, did another one. Um, yeah, this is true. Five years, time flies. It's true. I I do have some other things I wanted to talk about, but let me get to these questions. Okay, here's one. Hopefully, I didn't miss any. Lee H Lee from Texas. Good to see you. Um, I don't think I've seen your name before. Uh, so if there's anyone new here, let me know. I'm always I'm always excited to see new people joining the stream. So ZM10 Mark IV, how to zoom lens with backup camera instead of twisting the lens. Oh, ah, geez, I don't have an EM10 Mark IV, but uh wow, that's a let's see. I think it would be the same on my Pen F here. Let me just double check. That's that's something I never do is is zoom from the camera. Uh but I think you can assign a button. Let me see. Button. No, you cannot assign a button. I think this one you can assign this lever, but most cameras don't have that. Um, dang it. You're really picking my brain here. Where would that be? Not in there. As far as I can tell, you can really only do it. Let me let me change the live view. I might have to display live view. Uh, control settings, PASM, live control, super control. Okay, so let me go to the live. There it is, super control. It might be in the super control panel, or not super control, but live control panel. If it's not there, then the only way to do it is when you're in movie mode. Let me turn my touch screen on. I always turn my touch screen off. I'm not a huge fan of that. Let me just check one more thing. Touch screen, where is that? Dang it. Uh, probably in the HJ menu. Touch screen settings. Okay, on. It's in the K menu. All right, so now, nope. Let me just double check movie mode because I know there. Yeah, it can only be done in movie mode. 
<clears throat> so just to show you in movie mode, uh, what you do is you kind of you kind of swipe from the side here. You'll see a little lip, and then you can select you can select what you want to zoom in and out. But that's yeah, you can only do it in movie mode. I don't think you can do power zoom in photo mode, unfortunately. But if anyone knows, leave it in the comments below or in the chat section. So yeah, it appears only, let me put it back into a photo mode. Yeah, that, that little tag is gone. And I thought maybe, I thought maybe you could do it from the live control panel. But I don't see it there either. So yeah, unfortunately, <clears throat> it doesn't look like it. Okay, uh, let's see. I think there was another question. And then <clears throat> Roger says, maybe doing a video on my menu setups for different photo subjects, macro landscape, wildlife, and others. Uh, Lee Hoy just did one. Glad you brought in Lee to Yeah, Lee. Lee is awesome. <clears throat> um, I could, but I don't... Yeah. The, I think setting up the My Menus are better for different shooting situations rather than shooting subjects, right? Because um, the, the, when you change the subject... <clears throat> I'm sorry. When you change what you're shooting... Uh, say go, doing doing uh, macro versus landscape to, versus astrophotography. There's so many variations within each one that it's better to set up custom modes for that specific type of subject: macro, landscape, astrophotography. So you could have custom modes C one two three all for landscape, but for different situations. Um, trying to set up, you know, within four custom modes or three custom modes, these various settings would be too limiting um, because, you know, sometimes a landscape, <clears throat> for example, you want to be at F8 shooting at, you know, ISO 200 and uh, using a super wide angle lens, right? But then in macro photography, you're using a 60 millimeter or 90 millimeter and you have focus stacking and things like that set up, depending on your camera, maybe just focus bracketing. And maybe you're using additional lighting. So while you could set up uh, C1 for macro, C2 for landscape, C3 for astro, it, it's a little bit too limiting. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that. I would, you know, for example, because, <clears throat> you know, wildlife is really the only genre that I set up custom modes for and, and for my professional work. So I'll give you two examples of how I use the custom modes and why this, this scenario wouldn't work, I think, for a lot of people, where you're setting up entire genres set into a one custom mode, right? Like for my wildlife, I have C1 set up for shutter priority, <clears throat> uh, wide area focus with bird detect. C2, I have set up shutter priority but uh, I'm using like five point or single point for bird on a stick type stuff. So you have bird in flight, bird on a stick. Uh, and then you might have a third one for uh, low light where you're not going to use shutter priority. Uh, you're going to go into aperture priority and set, you know, and uh, lower your ISO or raise your ISO. So just in wildlife alone, there's a lot of different ways to set up your custom modes as the situation changes very quickly, particularly birds, you know, bird in flight, bird on a stick, that's my most common. I have C3 set up for pro, pro capture, right? So if I'm doing bird on a stick, but I want to capture them taking off or landing, you know, pro capture makes more sense. So that's how I have my C123 set up just for wildlife, you know, birding. Uh, for my professional work, you know, I have C1 set up for, um, Ambient shot, no flash, C2 set up for using flash, and then C3 for bracketing, you know, HDR. 
uh, and depending on you know the conditions of the of the scene, you know, I'm, I'll use one, two, or three all at once. Not all at once, but you know, in sequence for an individual scene. Or I might only need to use one of those. So it makes more sense to set up your custom modes for an entire genre rather than, you know, you just can't do macro list. Just each one is so big and so many variations. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Um, Oh, you know, I've heard I've heard a lot of so Clint is saying hi everyone. Just back from Utah, Nevada, Arizona Road Trap. First extensive use of the 7 to 14 Pro remarkable lens. I've I've heard some say that's their very best lens for sharpness and everything else. Uh, it's not a lens I own. I have like a Panasonic 7 to 14 F4, which doesn't hold a candle to this lens, but it's good enough for what I do. Um, but yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about that lens. And uh, let me see. Lasse has come in. Marsha, good to see you. Seraphine, good to see you. Um, Bob says, word of caution. Oh, yeah, there was a firmware update. I posted a link to that. <clears throat> and that was kind of interesting. Some have been reporting like a huge improvement in the autofocus performance for subject detect. Uh, even though it's not listed specifically in the uh, firmware update, you know, information, they people have been reporting improved autofocus performance. Now I haven't updated yet because I'm gonna I'm gonna try and accumulate some more data points from you know the forums and users, uh, what their experience has been with the new autofocusing system. And then maybe try and set up a more controlled conditions to see if there really is a difference. Because I only have one OM1. It's not like I can update one and not the other. Uh, but so I'm going to have to do a lot of testing on my firmware 1.5 and then duplicate the testing conditions under firmware 1.6. So I'm going to try and do that. Um, But we'll see. I mean, the only condition I, I tested for before was when Robin Wong had an issue with the low light autofocusing. And uh, he, you know, and I was able to duplicate the problem he was having. And I've run into another user in the Micro Four Thirds forum where he was having issues with false positives. Like it was telling him he had focus when clearly he did not. So I'm going to try and duplicate that. Because that, that's the thing is, is, being able to, <clears throat> you know, because you want to try to avoid confirmation bias, right? Like you upgrade this firmware, people tell you the AF is better, then suddenly it starts, it just feels like it's better, but you can't quantify it. So I want to try and quantify if there is a difference in, in, the, in the firmware update when it pertains to this autofocus. Uh, I can tell you right now, there's probably no way for me to uh, confirm that the autofocus is better for, say, birds in flight, uh, because it's always been so good. Uh, but I, I do want to, I do want to try and test for it uh, in in a studio situation. So I got some fake birds and stuff. Uh, so I'm going to test things like: is it focusing on the branches in front or on the bird behind it? You know, behind the branches. If there's any improvement there, that's something I can test for in a studio. Um, <clears throat> you know, things like that. And then I can try and uh, do the low light focusing test again. Supposedly Marco, I think, said he may have seen an improvement there. So I have a post on my community page here on YouTube uh, where people are leaving comments. Like the most recent one I saw was that Mike, Mike Lane, I think is his name, said that uh, there's very little difference now between the OM1 Mark II and the OM1 uh, in terms of autofocus. So it's not clear to me that if that means that the OM1 Mark II is not improved, or if that means the OM1 Mark I improved up to the level of the OM1 Mark II. Uh, it's, a, it's a little vague, right? It depends how you look at that statement, right? Because the statement was the OM1, there's very little difference between the OM1 Mark II and the OM1 Mark I. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean... You, you, you see where I'm coming from, right? So uh, I guess he has a video out, so I have to watch that. 
Um, but okay. Um, but yeah, when you do the firmware update, everybody is telling you, telling me that all your custom settings and time and date and everything gets reset. So this is a hard factory reset uh, of the camera. Now, if that was intentional and that had to be done because of the updates they're making, uh, which would make sense, right? Because think about it. If they make any change in the, in, in the system, any custom settings that you made will, will, you know, will not be applicable anymore because you might be trying to access a feature that has been changed fundamentally in your custom setting. And now with the update, that custom setting is no longer valid. So there may have been enough changes either in the order of the menu system. I don't know what changes have been done. I haven't done it yet. But there may have been some change that required this fundamental reset of all the settings, time, and date. That said, it might be a bug. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, just be warned. You know, what I'm curious though, what I haven't heard people say is that they save their custom settings onto their computer because you can do that through OM Workspace after the firmware update, were they, were they able to reload that custom setting or not? Because if they cannot reload that custom setting from before, that tells you there was a very fundamental change somewhere in the firmware that all your previous custom settings are really not going to be valid anymore. Uh, so that I have not heard. So if anybody's done that, like been able to reload their custom settings either through the app on their phone or through OM Workspace, uh, let me, let me know, um, because I'm, I'm going to do it eventually. Right. But I want to try and get set up a testing methodology and all that before I update to see if I can quantify the differences, if any, um, but okay. But thank, thanks for that warning and that reminder on that. Um, let's see. And. John follows. Good to see you. John has been with us a long time. I really appreciate it. It's great seeing all these uh, uh, followers from years and years ago. Like Roberto just mentioned, it's been five years. I mean, I just can't believe it. Oh, Owen System did a great video on petapixels for wildlife. Okay, I haven't seen that yet. Um, and Lee says, I'm relatively new. Been following you since a month and a half ago. Second live stream and I'm watching. Awesome. So glad to have you here. Uh, let's see. Baybridge. Hello, Rob. What's your views on UV filters? A lot of people hate using them as protection because they degrade the lens. If you buy a high quality UV filter, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I don't use them personally uh, because I don't want to spend a lot of money on a UV filter. But that said, uh, there, there is, there can be some side effects to the UV filter. Uh, when I was shoot, I put, a, I bought a decent UV filter for my 300 millimeter f/4, and while the sharpness and the overall image quality was still excellent, like I could not tell any difference between the two. I did notice in the out of focus areas, the background blur was much busier with the UV filter on rather than without. And the speculars were just a train wreck. So I stopped using it. And that has to do with they didn't polish that UV lens anywhere near as well as they polished the lenses on the lens itself, right? Uh, so generally speaking, I would just probably not use them for, uh, as a rule of thumb, I, would, I don't use them because I don't want to spend money. But I haven't spent money on an expensive UV filter. I bought a decent one. But it was, you know, it was like a $50 UV filter, which is a lot, right? I mean, you can spend a lot on a filter. And I was disappointed with it. Uh, so I, I would say just, just don't bother. Better, better to use a lens hood to protect your front element than using a UV filter, in my opinion. 
Um, but yeah, that's what I think there. I have competition with the televised Amsterdam gold race, cycle race. Panning birds in flight for me is difficult. It goes. It comes with practice. You get better at it. You know, after after a few days of practicing, uh, you'll be fine. You know, if you go like a couple of weeks or a month or months, like I go months sometimes without shooting birds, uh, it takes me a couple of days again to kind of get back into the tracking. But you get you get pretty good at it. Hello, Rob. Bought the S1R to play with. Good price. Use. I know. I I shop that thing every other day, and I'm not seeing the prices seem to be going up now on that camera. Ugh, the S1R is big with buttons in the right places and learning and satisfying curiosity. Like your work, thanks. Yeah, I I had the S1R for a little while, and uh, you know, money no object. I would have kept it, but I was like. It, you know, I paid, I think, like 1400 bucks for it at the time, <clears throat> uh, like as an open box, I think. But I was like, $1,400, am I really going to use this camera? I mean, and, and the autofocus for taking pictures of my dog wasn't great. I mean, it had a lot of limitations. It's not an action wildlife camera, <laughs> okay? You know, I, I tried to think of a lot of reasons to keep it and a lot of reasons to to get my money back because I could I used I you know I need the money. And ultimately I decided to return it. And it's probably the only regret that I've had in terms of gear is returning that S1R. Because what makes the the S1R and the L mount system in general really excellent are the lenses. You can get very affordable lenses for you know that have outstanding image quality and you'll get i mean the rendering of those images the sharpness the detail everything about those lenses they're they're technically really good and uh the color science coming from the s1r it had a slight purplish <coughs> tint to it in the highlights um <clears throat> which may be a reflection of the overall color science in the uh, image, but I really like the colors I got out of that S1R. And then, of course, the resolution is outstanding. And the execution of the high-res shot mode and the focus stacking uh, are excellent, as good as the OM system's execution. So, yeah, it was big and heavy, you know. Uh, but it, it's not... You know, if it's a camera I would take out once in a while, I'd be okay with that, you know. But yeah, congrats on that. That's that's an awesome camera. Definitely get the 50 millimeter. Get get the F1.8 Prime series. If you're a prime person, the 35, the 50, the, the 85, those three lenses, you can probably get all three lenses uh used uh combined for about twelve hundred bucks, and you're set. If you're more of a zoom person, their f4, the 24 to 105 f4, is amazing, amazing lens. Um, so you could do 24 to 105 and then a prime of your choice, right? Uh, the 24 to 105 is about $800 used, and you can get a prime for about 250, 300 used. So you get you get that combination there, and you're ready for everything, right? That's they, yeah, that system. And then they came out with the new 100 macro. I think it's a 100 millimeter macro, very compact, yet tack sharp. So, yeah, the L system, L mount system is really flushed out really well with excellent lenses. Um, so, I think, I think you'll really enjoy that, that, that as a system. It's not like your everyday camera, obviously, because it's so big, but it's definitely, I think, probably the closest thing you'll get to a like a quality system uh you know for full frame that is and uh let's see barm says i sold my 100 to 400 i almost never liked the image quality that came from that lens yeah i've heard mixed reviews most people are very very happy with it uh but yeah there's been times when people have like not been able to get the kind of images that they wanted from it and for me, I went 
a 300 millimeter f4 because i was looking for super telephoto and uh i tried out you know i borrowed david's 100 to 400 and i also had a chance to try the 300 f4 and ultimately i decided the extra stop or stop and two-thirds of light that i get with the 300 f4 was more important than the extra reach i got with the 100 to 400 uh and then i just added a teleconverter and i'm all set uh the 1.4 so you can pick up the 300 f4 for 2000 bucks used that is that'll be the best money you ever spend if you're into uh wildlife or you need a super telephoto lens for something that 300 millimeter f4 is i would i would argue is the very best lens olympus ever made um it just just the the optical quality of that lens is just outstanding and <clears throat> you know there's a lot of when i was doing my testing and comparing that to the 100 to 400 Clearly, the zoom was not as sharp as the 300 f4, but I didn't feel like it was such a so bad that you know I would never get that lens. If if zooming was more of a priority for me than the extra stop of light, I would have been fine with the 100 to 400. But for me, the the extra stop of light was more important than the ability to zoom in and out. Uh, but I would I wouldn't have hesitated to buy the 100 to 400, you know, if the reverse were true. So, um, I think your next step is is the 100 to 400, or if you really need to zoom, I've heard great things about the 150 to 600. Uh, I know David Crooks loves his, <laughs> and and others. So that's something that you might want to consider. But just understand nothing is going to match that 300 f4 aside from the 150 to 400 you know this the the big white lens uh nothing's going to come close to that and uh let's see marco is here hey marco that reminds me uh okay so i need to get to a couple of things one is uh, I'm going to be on a live stream next week with Emily Talpin as her guest. <laughs> it's like I rarely get to be a guest on a live stream. So that's going to be on Friday, I believe, April 19th. So look look for that on Emily's channel, YouTube channel, uh, that I'll be there live. And we're going to talk for a couple hours about, you know, photography mainly, uh, but also, you know, go into OM Systems a little bit, uh, clearly, because we both are big fans of the system. And, uh, you know, and you'll get to, you get a little behind the scenes about me as well. I mean, I, I, you guys pretty much know me if you've been following me a long time. Uh, there may not be any new information there, but I'm going to try and bring some things that maybe I've never talked about before, uh, you know, about my photography and, and myself a little bit as well. Uh, but I'm also going to try and give some good, good information and advice but look at it as more of an interview uh, type scenario where you would learn more about me. Um, but there, there's always going to be some great tips uh, across the board when it comes to photography. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of something for everyone. Because some of you probably don't care about me at all, right? It's like, yeah, so what? <laughs> uh, oh, and then Marco, good morning. So I got a text this morning from David that. Uh, um, yeah, okay, sorry. I got a text from David this morning that there's been chatter about me on, on Facebook that I'm like, I haven't made any OM System Olympus videos in a while. Uh, maybe I was leaving OM Systems or, um, you know, and people are going to miss me. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, and I get it. I get it. Uh, I mentioned this briefly last week, but I've been dealing with some, some medical health issues. Nothing, like I said earlier, nothing serious at this point. But I've only been able to produce videos that are kind of mandatory, right? When I'm doing product reviews, because I made a commitment when I got the product to do a review of that product. 
and I haven't had the energy to do much else. Now, I've been responding to comments and emails and answering people's questions, and I greatly appreciate um, uh, some of the donations people have made. Some, some made a very generous donation the other day or yesterday. Uh, and I greatly appreciate that because, you know, I just, they email me and I email them back with for some potential solutions for whatever problem they're having. And they're so grateful, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, I get it. Like this one was about when they go into, um, I'll just show you this because this, this is a problem, right? Where. You know, you go into the information view. I don't know what it's called exactly, but this is this is not the control panel. This is just the information panel, right? And then when you click the OK button, you should be able to scroll around just like the super control panel, right? However, what they were finding was that. When they when they went into the super control panel, they weren't able to move around and select any. Oh, of course, it works now. Did I did I change it or not? Now it's working. Well, <clears throat> okay. I'll have to rethink how I fix that problem because now it's working all the time but they weren't able to use the joint the the d-pad to move around and make changes to the control panel and then i said okay well you need to do this that and the other thing and basically you had to deep dive into the button menu and change the the the, the uh, d-pad configuration to select focus points or whatever i think it was there i can't remember now my memory is so bad it's amazing i get along as well as i do because Seriously, I just did that this morning <clears throat> or yesterday. I just showed them how to fix that yesterday. Now I can't duplicate it because I can't remember what the problem was exactly. I thought I thought that was it. But yeah, <clears throat> when I make videos for uh, the tutorials or the Ask Rob Treks, which I haven't done in a while, they take a lot of time. Uh, for me because I need to make sure I cover all the bases and make sure that some other setting, for example, is not going to mess with the solution that I'm introducing. Because you know how it is. You go into menu and it's like, why is this grayed out? Or why is this not working? Well, it's because you have to go back to setting you know, A, B, C and change those before settings D, F, E work, right? Um, so I, I do my best to cover all the bases so that anyone that has this similar issue understands what needs to be changed where and if there's any uh, mitigating factors or additional things that need to be set that may not be all that intuitive, right? Um, but anyhow, uh, Yeah, I like I said, I did ha I did have that camera for for about a month, and I, I regret giving it back. The S one R, such such a great camera. Um, when I get past some of these other issues, I'm gonna start really shopping again for that camera. I look at them every day, but prices are creeping back up on everything. Oh, Bob says he reloaded the settings after the update and restored his custom settings. So if you do the firmware up, uh, update to 1.6 and you saved your settings in your app or in your workspace, you should be able to reload them. So that's, that's good to know. Thank you, Bob. And then Lee says, I reload the settings, but not all were covered. Aperture value, custom modes. Okay, so there may still be some gaps in the reload. Interesting. I think I'm not sure aperture gets saved though in custom settings. Aperture value. If you say <clears throat> I think that may be the exception anyway. I'm not sure exactly. I can try it. 
if I recall, I could set save aperture f5.6 in a custom setting, but it's not going to recall that. So let me do aperture priority. Let's say f8. And then let me save that to custom setting. Custom setting one. All right, so I'm going to dial it back to f2.8. And then let's roll into custom setting one. Oh, no, it did save the aperture value. Okay, so that's something I have to test for after I update. So there's a, yeah, there's a lot of things I have to check for, right? Like, like this. There's just all these little things. And you guys are always bringing these up to me. And I'm like, oh, man, I've never, never paid attention to that before because it's, it's uh, not something that... Because you know how it is, right? You're, you're like using the camera. You just want to go out and shoot, right? You want to take pictures. And if something's not exactly right, I'm like, okay, let me just change it and go back to taking pictures. And then you forget about it. Because uh, there was another issue that came up where the autofocusing worked better uh, when I was using night, night live view, like the night vision. In low light, if you have night vision turned on, the autofocus works better, <laughs> I think. Don't don't quote me on that. But that's something else I wanted to test for and then completely forgot about, you know. Uh, but that try that though. See if see how fast your autofocus is with night vision turned on versus turned off in low light. And I think you'll see a difference. And let's see. Chandra says, uh, hi, Rob. Cheers from Singapore. I've been to Singapore once. Um, question last week when I turn on, and it was just uh, the airport. I didn't leave the airport. <laughs> question last week when I turn on my M52, I got the power button issue. The switch not working. Insert the battery camera on, remove the battery camera off. Oh, okay. I haven't had that issue with mine. I've heard about this power button issue. But this has not happened to me, unfortunately. Or fortunately, this has not happened to me. I, I, I don't have any, any tips for you on that because it just hasn't happened to me. Um, and Oh, Emily. Hey, Emily. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, I, just, I just mentioned the, the stream for Friday that we're going to be on together. Um, yeah, practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. Get out there. Um, and Emily is so much fun on her channel. I just uh, I just love her enthusiasm. And every time I watch, I feel like, you know, she 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 always is like, what's the word I'm like? It's almost like it's the first time she's picked up a camera and just is wowed, right? And every time she picks up the, the camera, she's like, wow, look at what this can do. Look at that. Like, she hasn't been doing it for years now. You know, it's, it's always like she's looking at things with fresh eyes. She's always so excited and happy about things. Your month day was also not restored, which makes sense. But YMD language and many other settings, including EVF auto switch settings, were reset by the update. Okay, good to know. Uh, and David has some feedback here. UV filter, I've experienced edge haze using high spec filters. So like you, results... Are better without yeah so even a high spec uh uv filter you know you buy a bmw or a you know tiffin high-end whatever the brand i'm not that into filters there's, there's always going to be some compromise when you put another piece of glass in front of a piece of glass and usually you know so yeah i would just i would probably just not use them and i don't and yeah, good to see you, Paul. Always good to see you. And let's see. Oh, that's for Baham. And John says, I'm still undecided on wide angle lens for church interior, 7 to 14 or Lumix 9. I would get the Lumix um, because it's faster. At, I think it's a 1.7 or 1.8 versus a 2.8. That's a significant difference. And that that difference between and you know seven millimeters and nine millimeters is pretty nominal. Uh, you you won't have to worry about it. 
and being able to zoom into 14, I, you know, and the nine millimeters is much smaller lens and lighter. So I think, I think you'll get more use out of it specifically for the extras. Anytime you can get a faster lens, get a faster lens. That's my opinion. That's why I prefer primes, generally speaking, over zooms. Uh, you know, my 300 millimeter F4 being my most expensive example. But when I go out, I prefer shooting primes. Um, if, if I have the prime available in that focal length, the exception being is I don't have a 14 or 15 millimeter prime. So I use my kit lens a lot. Uh, because it can go to 14, but I do miss having the extra stops of light. But yeah, just imagine being able to shoot the scene at ISO, say, 800 with a 9 millimeter. You would be at uh, you would be at 16. You'd probably be at ISO 2000 with the f2.8 versus ISO 800 with the f1.8 uh, on the 9 millimeter, and that's that's a big deal. Uh, especially if you're not going to do any post-processing uh, and use denoise and all of that. And even if you do, when you're taking pictures of people in a church and at that wide angle, they're going to be very small in the frame. You're going to, you're going to lose some details and people are going to look weird. Uh, their skin can get very pasty or whatever. So yeah, always go for the faster lens if you can. Just, just my opinion, just how I shoot, you know. The 150 to 600 is so heavy, just, yeah. I know, right? Um, that's not the reason I'm not getting it. Because I'm, I'm so happy with my, my three, ouch, 300 F4 that uh, I can, you know, I... I don't I don't feel a need because I have the 1.4 teleconverter. I don't need that extra reach. Honestly, I feel like if you're that far away where you need a 600 millimeter lens, you're too far, and it's it's not going to be a good shot anyway. Just my opinion. I I'd rather try and get a little bit closer. Now I get it. There's there's going to be plenty of situations where 300 millimeter f4 ain't going to cut it, and you need 600. You know, but I'm not going to I'm not doing that. I'm just not doing it. I'd rather get closer and get get a better shot if I can, or not get it at all. Uh, if I was running into situations where 600 is going to save me, shot after shot after shot, I would seriously consider it. But I'm just doing birds and flight and stuff, you know, for fun, right? I'm not trying to get some award-winning shot. And if it's too far away for 300 millimeters, it's okay. I'll just get it when they come a little closer, you know. <laughs> Uh, but you know, there's there's a lot of wildlife scenarios I can see. People want that 600, or sometimes people just even for birds in flight, they want 600. They don't care if you know they're that far away. Giving them getting that 600 millimeters gives them the reach that they want because ultimately it's about what kind of personal satisfaction do you get out of shooting, right? What 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 are you going to enjoy doing? And the, the cost of that lens versus how much more I'm going to get out of my photography in terms of enjoyment is that that balance is way off, right? You know, uh, I mean, if the lens were like somebody gave me that lens, I'd be like, okay, now, now we're talking, you know, a little bit more even, right? But I, I'm not going to spend money on a lens on a genre that I just enjoy for fun and don't take that seriously. Uh, you know, granted, you could say I spent all that money on that lens. I must be taking it seriously, right? But I really didn't spend that much on the 300 F4. I did buy brand new, but it was on sale. And I traded in a bunch of stuff to get it. So I ended up only up paying about $800 for that lens. And the stuff I traded in was bargain stuff, like crazy, crazy stuff. Like, you know, film cameras that I paid $7 for and I got $300 on trade. You know, it's like, Man, you know, anyway, uh, Zoltan, always good to see you. Zoltan's really good with those little uh, icons, man. I don't know how to do that. Put these icons on everything. That's why, you know, anyway. Uh, Emily said, I'm so excited to have you on my channel, Robin. Yes, we do all care about you. Can't wait to chat with you and all your work as a photographer and YouTube. Okay, yeah, we're going to talk about my YouTube channel a little bit too. Uh, that reminds me, I do want to, and I'm excited too. I can't wait to to go on your channel and 
and hopefully meet some new uh, viewers maybe that haven't seen my channel. Um, because there's there's always you always have your own audience that you know they don't bother really checking out other channels. Um, but what's the other thing? Let me pull up your thing again. I can't remember what I was going to talk about. I can't remember. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. <laughs> For all you Taylor Swift fan, Google News has her using Olympus OMD Mark One. Wow, that is something I didn't notice. And and this is you know YouTube. It's always related to what you're what you're um, searching for and what you watch, right? But more recently, I'm seeing a lot of videos on people using older cameras. You know, like 10, 20 years old. And getting great results and i'm also seeing a lot of channels people using om systems uh so i definitely click like on those anytime you see a channel that doesn't normally talk about micro four thirds click the like button you know show your support for micro four thirds at least from a you know the the creator standpoint we'll really appreciate it but also from a broader sense youtube will push these types of videos out more, right? Even if it's just a 0.01% more, you could be talking about millions of people when you multiply that percentage out by the number of views per day, all of that stuff, right? And that's all it takes, right? Um, oh, gosh. But yeah, I've been seeing a lot of videos uh, on that. You know what I hate, though, is like, I click on one video of a cute girl, right? Like. And not all of a sudden, man, I'm like flooded with all these like <laughs> videos. And I'm like, no, no, I, I, I want to look at photography, you know? Yeah, she was cute, but I was like, come on. <laughs> YouTube is like, there must be a ton of content out there of cute girls on YouTube because I was just flooded with them all of a sudden out of nowhere. Thankfully, the algorithm is kind of going back to showing me photography related stuff. But I was like, you know, I, I don't want to see all these videos. I just just clicked on it because I thought she was cute. And then all of a sudden, I'm like flooded with what was it? It was a fishing video or something like this cute girl was out fishing and caught this gigantic fish. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And she's cute. So I watched it. And now all of a sudden, I have all these, not even about fishing. I got all these videos of cute girls. And I'm like, <laughs> Seriously, um, but that's finally that's out of the, the cycle, and I'm back to to my normal thumbnails that I like to see. <laughs> yeah, YouTube is crazy sometimes. Hi, Rob. Joined a bit late, but hi, dog. Yep, good to see you, Gordon. And Richard Cook. Good evening in Japan. Yeah, it's late. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the other thing I was going to talk about. Now my hands are cold. Ah, oh, what is it? 66 degrees in here. That should feel warm. I don't know why I feel cold. Uh, I think I talked about Facebook. People were like worried I was going somewhere. And I talked about the 150 and people were, yeah, so I talked about, oh, oh, uh, all right. Let me pull up an image. This is a good, good a time as any to, uh, um, Show, show a picture I did because I talked about last week I was watching Wes Anderson movie Asteroid City and I wanted to try to duplicate that color palette in camera uh, and of course I brought my um, I got out my Olympus camera because who else does better colors than the Olympus Pen F right this this bad boy right here <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so there's the, let's see if this comes up. Whoops. Can I pull this up? Are you going to see it? Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, Asteroid City. Um, really interesting movie, but the, what struck me was this very pastel-y type color scenario. 
So I took a picture yesterday. Man, I was really bad shape yesterday with this cold. But I got a couple of pictures out yesterday that I just took on my front porch here. And I was trying to duplicate that look. And I think I achieved it. So the secret sauce to getting this particular color palette is the art filter pale and light number two. So pale and light filter number two. And pretty much, and then dial in plus two on amber, you know, the white balance, plus two on amber, minus two on green. So you just make the image a little bit warmer. Uh, and you get pretty much this straight out of camera. Now in post-processing, I did tweak it a little bit. I added a little bit more orange, but you're about 90% there just using the pale and light uh, art filter and then dialing in, in your control panel, you'll see the A and G next to the white balance on the super control panel. Dial in plus two on amber, minus two on green, just to give it a little bit more warmth. And uh, yeah, I'm rocking my 1970s glasses there. But I, I specifically wore like a pastel suit uh, and white shirt for this shot. And tan, you know, khaki pants. But I think these came out okay. I think the color palette is really, really close to what I saw in that movie. Uh, now, in that movie, they had stronger blues, right? Stronger blues and reds. There was certainly, and I just didn't have any of that in this, this particular scene. Uh, but I'm going to try and go out uh, and, and find some scenes that have good color in them that I can uh, try and recreate the kind of scenes that I saw in that movie. Uh, just I just got a little inspired by that movie a little bit. Okay, where'd my mouse go? So I wanted I wanted to try and do that. Huh. Eric is saying that Facebook is far worse. I don't use Facebook that much. Um I, I, I only have enough energy for one social media, and that's here on YouTube. The other stuff, you know, I just post whatever, my Instagram, my Flickr, I just post whatever. Uh, you know, I try to be a little bit deliberate, but I don't spend any time trying to build that audience. Like, I'm not trying to build my Flickr audience or Instagram audience. It's just, it, yeah, I just don't need that kind of hassle or work, not hassle, but workload on my brain. Seeing a lot of folks using older, maybe 2012 to 16 small MFT cameras and prices on used camera sites seem to reflect that. Yeah, prices are just going up crazy everywhere. It's just insane. Um, I really, I really, really, really like my little Panasonic Lumix LX5. That camera is just, just the best thing ever. But you have to take that in the context of where I'm coming from because I have all these other cameras, right? I got everything that I could possibly want except the S1R. So it's, it's, it's a very, very different experience for me when I'm shooting with that LX5 than it would be for somebody buying a camera for the first time. So I, I don't recommend people just buy an old 2010 camera as their first camera, right? Because they're gonna be sorely disappointed with the results and the, the image quality and the handling and the use case, you know, just using the camera is very awkward sometimes. And somebody just starting out using one of these as their first camera is going to get frustrated very quickly, if not with the results they're getting, but with the uh, usability of the camera. It's nothing like a modern camera. So, but see, when I use it, right, I got years of photography behind me and I can appreciate the controls and, and I'm, you know, it's, I'm I'm at a point in my photography where when I pick up an older 2010 2012 camera it's it's refreshing in a way right because the colors are different the the resolution is certainly different you're getting a very different look from these cameras uh, so people yeah so I I I I hate these thumbnails where people show 
like this old digi cam and say this camera shoots like film i hate that i mean i, I mean i don't hate it you know but i'm just saying that it's a little misleading to say this camera shoots like film i think it's more of a film like experience because you are limited in many ways just like you are with film but the images that come out of a digital camera will never look like film they just they just won't i mean it, you can try a much better way to deal with getting that film look is just using a lut or a pre you know one of these uh what do they call them the presets and things that's the way to get the film look at least and it can be pretty close sometimes but you're never going to get it repeat those results shot after shot after shot no matter what you're doing because the color response from film is very different than the color response of a digital sensor. Digital sensors are designed to give you, at least the modern sensors are designed to, modern cameras, I should say, are designed to give you the most accurate color possible with maybe a few minor tweaks, right? But the early digital cameras, 2000s, right? <clears throat> a lot of them, from what I've been reading is they did try to reproduce a more filmic type color science. And there is definitely a difference in the colors when I compare a CCD camera versus say uh, CMOS. But that's not because the sensor technology is different, it's because the color science was different because CCD sensors tend to be older cameras and the color science you know, the approach to color science was a little bit different in the early stages of digital where they were intentionally trying to reproduce the colors of film. But anyway, that's just my impression from what I've been reading and shooting with. Because I can, I do see a difference, right, in my much older cameras in the color science. Uh, and that, I think that was intentional. Like when I shot with my Pentax K10 or my Olympus E500, um, you know, the CCD camera sensors, I have a Nikon D80 that I want to take out. That also has a CCD sensor. Uh, but as you know, going from Canon to Nikon to Olympus to Pentax to whatever, everyone has sort of their own secret sauce to their colors, right? <clears throat> um, and the only way to really get the colors the way you want them is you're going to have to post-process your RAWs and work with the presets or come up with your own presets, whatever, to get that filmic look. Like I did here with, with, with the uh, image I showed earlier where I was trying to reproduce that sort of pastel -y look that I was seeing in the Wes Anderson Asteroid City movie. Um, I had to do two things. I had to use the pale and light art filter and then I had to do a little bit more tweaking in post. Um, anyhow, oh my goodness, David Crooks is here. Hey, David, how are you? I thought you'd be out at the, uh, the what time? It's only 10 o'clock. Didn't you go to the car and, what are they, drifting, car drifting thing? I thought that was today. Um, but okay, so... That's just about everything I had uh, to talk about, I guess. If anyone has any questions or want to talk about anything else, just let me know in the, the chat section. Um, I, uh, oh, it says, besides Canon, aren't all other manufacturers using Sony sensors? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, the sensor itself is not where the... The only thing on the sensor is they have the micro lenses, right? That have the different color filters on them. I would imagine that those are designed to reproduce exactly red, exactly green, the RGB, what do they call it? The Bayer array, RGB, Bayer array, red, green, and blue. They're designed to reproduce the colors exactly, right? Or to capture the colors. It's not perfect. It's never perfect, right? Uh, but um the the magic of this color science is in the processing of the raw after the image has been captured by the sensor 
one one interesting fact about the S1R is it does not use a Sony sensor. It uses I, I forget who makes it, maybe Toshiba or somebody, but it's not a Sony sensor, so that camera is kind of a little bit unique in that way too. Which is another reason I kind of like it. I don't attribute the color science to the sensor on that on that camera. The color science is definitely all Panasonic, but uh, just fun fact. Yeah, Canon. Canon makes their own sensors. I guess they have their own fabrication. I, I really never looked into Canon. That's the one camera system I really don't have. I have had Canons in the past. Uh, I had the Canon M50, which I traded for something. Uh, it was I traded for an Olympus something. I can't remember what it was. Um, no, no, I didn't. I traded my Canon M50 for that Fujifilm that I have, which uh, I need to take it out more. I'm going to take it out more. Actually, they sent me a lens. I got a lens in for the Fujifilm cameras that I'm going to test. It's an interesting lens. I, I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. I guess it's not, not been officially re released. But I have, a, I have two new lenses not released yet for my Canon and my Sony, which I love. I love that I can build out my lens system without spending a lot of money. Um, you know, I still have to pay taxes on it because they, they come in. But uh, That's that's the only that's the only reason I'm keeping those systems is because I can get lenses for them. I wish they'd make more lenses for Micro Four Thirds, because uh, that's the most open system on the planet. You know, they they're like, you want to make a Micro Four Thirds lens? Here's all the specs. Knock yourself out, right? So I don't know why why more more of them aren't making it. Um, because I'd certainly get the Micro Four Thirds version in most cases than I would would any other mount. Because I just I just like Micro Four Thirds by far the best, the best system ever, uh, in my opinion. Uh, another photographer site I enjoy is Degriff Gallery. He's his own cameras and OP, I don't know what OP3 is. Uh, he has some wonderful landscape work. I Yeah, yeah okay, I know who Degriff is. Yeah, definitely. He does some great work. Um, I don't watch his. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't watch his channel much. I catch. I catch a video every now and then by him. Um, but lately, my my YouTube my choices for YouTube videos lately have been um, more photography centric and and lighting. I really. I'm really trying to get good at lighting. Uh, so I have some more lighting products that I'm going to review here next week. And like I said, I'm going to try and make, like I did that flash, the V1 Pro, and then I did the, the battery charger. You know, I spent 12 hours making that video for a $50 item, but I didn't make that video just because I could get a charger. I thought that charger was really good. I said, yeah, definitely. I want to show you guys. You know, if you're if you have a Sony camera, uh, that that charger is really good. So a lot of a lot of the products that I review, you know, I I hopefully they're 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 interesting and useful to you guys because I don't I get offers all the time. I have a few companies that just say pick anything you want out of our catalog. We'll send it to you. And I'm like, ah, well, not right now. I'm too busy. But, um, you know, I, I try to pick things like that articulating arm, you know, for the tripod extension arm. That's a great product. It's like a $60 extension arm. Trust me. When you, when you put in, when you count the dollars per hour that I made off that video, right? <laughs> I mean, I was making pennies on the, pennies pennies on that video but i made it because i thought that extension arm was really a very useful photography tool and and i made that video just just for you guys really um not because i you know needed to get a free extension arm i mean i can buy a 60 dollars extension arm right why would i spend i spent my god i spent probably 20 or 30 hours making that one uh, and I spent about 12 hours making 
the one on the battery charger. And I'm not even counting the time I had to drain my batteries down, which took hours and hours so that I could test the charger, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, definitely, even if you don't have a Sony camera, you should watch that video on the battery charger because there's some good information there about charging rates and wattages and things like that that you can apply to your next purchasing decision for battery chargers. Um, I'm going to try and get some battery chargers in for OM systems. I have a couple, but there's nothing special about them. They're $15, $20 chargers that just charge at a very, very slow rate. Um, so I, you know, why bother making a video about a charger everybody makes? But this, this charger for the Sony camera from Elano, not everybody's making a charger like that. It's different. It's really good. Uh, let's see. And then Seraphim says, I had your health issues. Our family dropped all grains and milk and went protein and almond flour for bread. I'm your age and I feel 35. Went from 280 to 185. Awesome. Um, yeah, I've, I've made some pretty drastic changes in my diet since last year, hence the, the weight loss. And I've been maintaining this. I'd like to lose a little bit more fat, but gain some more muscle. So I need to start pumping that iron, you know, <laughs> uh, because my, you know, when I put my arm out the other day, when they took my blood pressure, I was like, my God, just get the child's uh, band out because my arm is so small. Far cry from the days when I used to actually work out. Time is a bitch. That's all I know. I need, I need, to, I need to start pumping some iron. Uh, but yeah, I made some drastic changes. I, I got rid of like, yeah, I'm very conscious of sugar salt and uh and dairy right i haven't cut out dairy i still love dairy products but i i used to eat cereal religiously like i would eat it for breakfast i'd have it as a snack later maybe before i go to bed at night milk 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 and cereal gone you know i switched to almond milk if i'm going to have cereal but i've cut out cereal altogether uh and I'm very conscious of sugar. You know, I don't add sugar to anything. I try to buy products that are low in sugar. You know, I've cut out most of the fruits in my diet, uh, except for the, the a few that I eat occasionally. I'll eat an apple occasionally or a banana. Bananas have good potassium in them. Uh, but it's not part of my regular diet. And... And then just cutting back overall on the total calories, which almost happens automatically when you cut out sugar and salt and, you know, uh, dairy. And all of a sudden, you know, you can eat like an entire bowl of salad. And it's like 100 calories <laughs> and you're full. So uh, that, that, that was a big change. Anyway. Uh, Took the 18 millimeter Lao out yesterday for nature photography. That had to be the most boring photo walk I ever had. I'm also agreeing with Robin with manual. No AF, no go. Yeah, autofocus. I, I definitely prefer autofocus over manual focus. I don't mind manually focusing if there's something particularly special about the lens. An 18 millimeter Lao lens is going to be a very sharp lens, I'm assuming, right? Because Lao makes good lenses. Uh, so why, why shoot? with a manual focus lens if it's going to give you great results, right? Um, meaning, if I'm going to shoot a manual focus lens, there has to be something kind of different about it. You know, like I like shooting with the vintage uh, Pen F lenses. I have a 38-millimeter uh, vintage Pen F, and the bokeh and look and feel from that lens is so beautiful that shooting manual focus with that lens is perfectly fine because there's the, the lens is clinically is uh technically has so many imperfections in it but that's what makes it great i have another uh i have a 35 millimeter f1.7 cct cctv lens right that's made for a very tiny sensor like a one over 2.3 or smaller but because you're using it on a huge relatively huge micro four-thirds sensor 
all of the defects of that lens start to come out almost immediately on the image sensor. And you get this beautiful rendering, right, that you can't re really reproduce in post-processing. So manual focus lenses for me are great when they are something, there's something else about them, some character about them. But yeah, am I going to buy a, you know, a 25 millimeter lens that's very sharp, but it's manual focus? Probably not, right? Because what would be the point unless I really like manually focusing? I'm going to be like, man, I just misfocused a little bit. This lens is so sharp, but I misfocus. That would be so frustrating, right? <laughs> Versus, you know, if I misfocus on a lens that's, you know, optically imperfect to begin with, it doesn't bother me quite as much because it's like, well, even if I did get nail focus, it wouldn't be that much better. I'm using this lens because of all the other qualities of the lens, not because, you know, uh, it's sharp. And the Lava lens would be a sharp lens that, if you miss focus, would be very frustrating. Let me see if I can find an image that I shot with that lens. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna do a quick look. Is this it? No. Ah. Uh... I should have one here. No, I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, is this is a picture of the lens, I think. Yeah, well, it's not a good picture of it, but let me show you this one. Here is, uh, this is the lens I'm talking about. 38 millimeter F1.8 for the original film camera pen F adapted to the uh, digital pen F. And what I like about it is you can see the, the flange distance here is very, very small, almost like M mount type camera, right? So it doesn't really add much bulk to the camera overall. And this lens, the rendering from this lens is just amazing. It really is. Uh, I have that picture. Maybe a picture that I took with this is right nearby it. Let me see. Oh, yeah, here's one. Yeah, there's a couple pictures right next to it that are related to that lens. So here, here's one I took with that lens. And if you look in the corners here, you know, look, look at how the bokeh has got really strong onion rings or uh, what's this called on the outside? Soap bubble effect. <clears throat> and it's a little bit swirly, right? Um, and the colors are a little bit different too. The lens is adding some color of its own to the image. And then this image here, uh, I wasn't using a lens hood, but it just, I just got this terrible flare in the image, right? <laughs> uh, but that's all in camera. So now I got this like swirly bokeh with the uh, onion ringing and, and soap bubble effect. And then I got this wonderful flare. So if I'm going to use an autofocus lens, it's going to be for all of these other kinds of properties uh, versus, let me see, is this... These are all XH2. I'm trying to see if there's anything else here. Yeah, I don't see anything else. But yeah, so anyway, I'm with you though. I don't like manual focus unless there's a reason for it. 
And then, hi, Rob, should I keep batteries fully charged by recharging recharg them when not fully depleted or run them down before recharge? Yeah, no need to run them down. Uh, you can recharge them at any time without running them down. I, I have seen uh, nickel cadmium, like if they're lithium ion batteries, the, the nickel cadmium batteries, uh, the NICADs, they, sh they should be recycled time to time. Um, because they do have, some of them have a memory effect. I think the more modern chemistry has, has eliminated that, even in NICADs, but it used to be general practice to uh, recycle or you know discharge and refresh the NICADs. But the lithium ions, there's no need to do that. Which would be like your camera batteries. The NICADs are typically like the uh, AA and AAA batteries. Those are typically NICADs or nickel metal hydrides, uh, but the, you know, anything with nickel in it, basically. But lithium ion, you don't need to worry about. <laughs> Pumping iron, burning with full frame, I know, right? Um, go join Planet Fitness and force yourself to go. The first 20 minutes sucks every day. Oh, I know. I. I got everything I need here at home in terms of gear. I used to belong to a gym back when I made money. I don't make hardly any money now, but back when I used to make money, uh, I went to the gym like four or five days a week at a minimum and then worked out at home on top of that. And I was so fit. My social life was very, very different though 20 years ago. I haven't been to a gym probably in 10 years. And, but I was running 20, 25 miles a week on top of that, doing weight training. This was before I started YouTube, right? 10, 10 plus years ago. Uh, and really before I got into photography, so I don't even have any pictures of myself from back then. But I was, yeah, I was a very, very different person. Let me see if I have a picture from that long ago. I don't see any. None that I'm going to be able to find easily. I would have to really dig <laughs> to find one. So manual focus on the ZF is pure. Oh, that's right. You got a ZF, right? I say manual focus, but not now. Wow, okay. Um... Made me pre-order the Boitlander 41.2 since they only make them small. Really? See, the Voidlander would be a special lens, right? Uh, if not optically, I mean, optically, I'm sure it's perfection, right? Because Voidlander is like, like right up there with Leica in terms of their build quality and their rendering. Um, I don't have any Voigtlander lenses, though. I only know them by reputation, actually. I don't think I've even ever shot with a Voigtlander. But I'm always tempted. I'm always tempted to get a Voigtlander. says, cut out all your dairy for sure. What other animal continues to drink baby food when fully grown? <laughs> I don't know. I never thought about it, but you're right. What other animals eat dairy after? I got to tell you, though, when, when I, you know, I make tacos every once in a while. I got to have some sour cream and Mexican cheese. I just, and, you know, and then you put the salsa and tomato. Oh, my God. I'm getting so hungry now. But I got to have, I got to have, I cannot. And that's really the only place that, and sometimes I make uh, fettuccine, right? So again, you got to have sour cream and Parmesan. It's rare. It's rare. Like I might have fettuccine, Parmesan once or twice a month, and I'll have tacos maybe once a month. I mean, not often when I make it at home. That's when, that's when I use the dairy products, but I don't, I will tell you, though, I do use butter almost daily. 
uh, I don't know if that counts, but it's a dairy product. And, and the reason is it's not so much, I mean, the flavor, I love the flavor and I use unsalted butter, right? But, you know, I found that because I, I switched to olive oil for everything, right? Because olive oil is the least processed cooking oil or oil of all the oils. And you can put it in your salad and put, a, put olive oil in everything because it's great flavor, right? But I found that butter, because you, you, if you guys ever use those nonstick pans, <laughs> this is so related to photography, right? But butter, my eggs don't stick. And I eat eggs. I eat eggs because I need to get protein somewhere. I mean, I, anyway, now I'm like telling you guys all my, my diet. But uh, like I said, I'm more conscious about salt and sugar than and a little bit of dairy. I stopped milk because that, that was pure sugar, as you said. But I found that butter, the eggs don't stick as much to the pan, even if it's a non-stick pan. Because after, after a while, the non-stick pans begin to stick anyway, right? Because the coating wears off. Even though the pan looks new, whatever that coating is, it just goes away. Uh, I found that the, the pans, the, the eggs stick less using butter than using olive oil. And I think it has something to do with the, the temperature where the olive oil starts to break down versus butter. Butter doesn't break down quite as quickly uh, with heat. Um, but anyway, yeah, I haven't cut out dairy completely. Like I've just cut out milk mainly. And it's all the sugar in milk that wouldn't let me lose weight. Yeah, I know milk is basically pure sugar. Now, what's interesting is there's different types of sugar, right? There's the very sweet sugar, like in honey, right? And then there's the very uh, mild sweet sugar, like in milk. So even though milk is almost pure sugar, you don't really taste it because it's a very mild tasting sweetness in the milk versus, say, honey, uh, which I learned somewhere along the way. Some cheap Chinese manual focus fast prime lenses are tiny, not great IQ, but good enough for casual street shooting. Absolutely. Yeah, someone gave me a 25 millimeter per gear f1.7. Uh, I've just never used it because I have an autofocus equivalent, but they are really tiny, right? It's this this little guy. Um, it was right here. Here it is. I mean, look how tiny that is. That's a tiny, tiny lens. Come on. Focus, focus, focus. There we go. Tiny, tiny lens, relatively speaking. And it's really well made. This is a great lens. I just never use it. Because uh, it's sharp, right? It doesn't have any particularly interesting characteristics for me to choose this over, say, my normal my normal lens, autofocus lens equivalent, whatever that is. I think I have a 23 1.4. Uh, for my Fuji. This is a Fuji mount, but they make them for Micro Four Thirds. Um, so I have the Pen F40 millimeter 1.4 adapted to Micro Four Thirds, and it's pretty nice. Five blades, so Boca and Pentagon's lens style. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> How you doing, Mike? You're relatively uh, new. I haven't seen you. I saw a comment from you the other day, but uh, I'm glad I'm glad you can make it into the stream. Uh, great question, Baybridge. I've wondered that on my own one, charging it around 60% if I was ruining it. No. Lithium-ion batteries, you don't need to worry. The only thing that's dangerous to lithium-ion batteries is heat. So don't leave them in your car. Just any way that you can avoid getting the batteries hot uh, is, is best. And... Yeah, I would I would avoid leaving leave, you know avoid heat on those because there's there's some sort of chemistry in in the lithium ion that breaks down with heat and as that breaks down the recycle number of charges and capacity also go down uh, <clears throat> and it's almost almost completely heat related because when you're using the battery it generates a little bit of heat right. 
but and that's that's what breaks the battery down a lot but um anyway i'm i'm not a i'm not a battery chemist or anything i'm just going off what i read online and what i can what i think is reasonable from what i read right uh but do your own due diligence on anything i say here I, honestly because I, I don't have access to any information that you guys don't, right? You guys have the same access to everything that I do. And we can all read the same thing, but come up with different opinions, right? And good early morning, Rob. My dad would always give us the up and at him phrase to wake up, up in the morning for school. Yeah. Gosh, I'm feeling so much better now that I'm talking to everybody. I really appreciate uh, all the, the participation here today. It's been It's been great. Uh, cause my mind has been, you know, kind of not, you know, anxious Been very anxious, uh, the last several months since, since late January, I should say. So I've just been gifted the 45 F8 Zuiko CN. What is CN? I'm not familiar with that. Man, my neighbor's doing something next door. I know you guys probably can't hear that, but it almost sounds like they're on my roof, which is fine because they have this big ass tree that hangs over my house and branches are falling off of it all the time onto my house. <laughs> so maybe they're clearing some of that crap off. I don't know. Uh... I'm trying to find a question. If I missed a question, you're going to have to type it again because I can't find find it. I thought there was one more. Let me see if I can get to the bottom here. Oh, wide open. It's really like the 38. Cool. Cool. Um, butter doesn't really have much dairy. It's 80% fat. The rest is milk, solids, and water. Okay. Good to know. And the olive oil we use, the Italians would laugh at. They actually export the bad olive oil to the U.S. I got a really good one, though. Since you're an expert on olive oil, let's just assume. Let me show you the one I got. I ha I had to get it because I can't pronounce it. This one. Um Esta Virgin something. I mean it was written like it doesn't say olive oil, it's written like in Italian, I think. So supposedly this is really, really good. All kinds of labels on the back. I don't know what they mean, but it's supposed to be good stuff. It was expensive. That's all I know. Oh, anyway. Uh, any thoughts on the Petapixel OM feature? I have no idea what Petapixel did with OM. If you could elaborate on that a little bit, but I'm not familiar. I know, all I know is that Chris uses OM systems for his personal stuff. Uh, and they also, a lot of OM commercials are on OM systems, the, the streams that they do. But I don't know much else about what they do. So I, I just don't have any thoughts. Uh, I became a vegetarian 33 years ago. Wow. And it's never been difficult since then to maintain proper weight. I say vegetarian because I'll occasionally eat cheese, but rarely. Otherwise, no dairy or eggs. Wow. I don't think I could do vegetarian. I couldn't do it. 
The only, the only vice that I have when it comes to food, I have two, right? That I'll treat myself to every once in a while, like pizza. Oh my God, I love pizza. Maybe once every couple of months, I'll have a slice or two of pizza. Oh my God. It's so bad for you, though. It's like they got that processed pepperoni. It's like just poison, right? The pepperoni. <laughs> and of course, the cheese and the dough and everything. But man, pizza is one of my biggest vices. That and Scrapple. I mean, Scrapple is probably the worst meat of all. It's not even meat, really. But every now and then, I, I, I love me some Scrapple. Let me tell you. Avocado oil is excellent for cooking. Oh, yeah, I don't use vegetable, canola, sunflower, because those are so processed. You wouldn't believe how many different layers of processing they have to go through to make that kind of oil. Whereas, you know, olive oil is just kind of pressed, uh, very little processing. But avocado oil, I have to try that. Avocado is so good for you. So good for you. I eat avocados all the time. But I've never tried avocado oil. I have to try that. And uh, we're transitioning to uh, a food channel here. I've tasted fresh homegrown pressed olive oil brought to the UK from Italy by a colleague who married into an Italian family. There's simply no comparison with the extra virgin from the supermarket. Wow. Wow. Now I'm curious. I have to look out for that. Rob, I found myself seeking more artistic type black and white photography. Have you gone through such phases? Yes, I have. Um, <clears throat> and I wouldn't call it a phase. I would just call it like, you know, expanding your photography into black and white. Because you never, you never really stop shooting black and white once you start, right? Uh, at least not, not for me. So don't look at it as a phase. Look at it as an expansion of your photography and how you see things. It's really not it's not a phase. It's it's another genre of photography that you can expand into and add to your, you know, life portfolio and art. So yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely use add black and white to your, your portfolio. I still shoot black and white all the time. You know, I and and it's it's an area that you can grow into and perfect and learn more about photography when you see colors, right? Because you have you have to be able to see in black and white when you're shooting in black and white. I know you can do it through the EVF, but when I look at red and green, I know that when I take a picture in black and white, they're going to look exactly the same, right? Because the luminance values are about the same. So you start to see light very differently and colors very differently when you start shooting in black and white because you look at the picture you take in black and white on your screen or on your computer and you compare that to what you saw with your own eyes and you start to appreciate light even more and then you start to use that in your black and white photography to try to get different tones and different shades and and look for light and luminance levels and it helps you to see in color even better right by shooting black and white and, you know at least for me when i when i go out and i like on a cloudy day and everything is flat i know that i can look at it and say well you know there's some yellow over here and there's some dark blues over here i know there's going to be some good contrast in my black and white photography right even though it might be a flat, cloudy day, and, and a color image might be very flat, but a black and white image will have very nice dramatic tones, right? That can easily be adjusted even more so in post-processing. So, yeah, look at it as, as expanding your photography, not as a phase. Oh, it has a lot of grain in it. I didn't know that. <laughs> All I know is, like, you have, you know, you have prime beef and then you have our pork and then you have uh hot dogs and sausage and then you have scrapple there at the bottom it's like the very worst of all of them i don't know what they do to make it taste so good gosh i'm making myself hungry
what are the best lenses transitioning to food channel what are the best lenses for food photography i think uh honestly i think like the for micro four thirds would be around 20, 25 millimeters uh between 25 and 45 right that way it allows you to get in really nice and close because if you use too wide of an angle like 14 millimeter you have to get pretty close to fill the frame and then you don't get you don't get as as good a perspective i mean there are creative choices to use wide angle lenses right but if you get closer to 25 millimeter which is a 50 millimeter sort of equivalent field of view uh you can hold the camera up a little higher and get a better perspective and the compression is a little bit different and a better view uh, and then when you step up to say 45 millimeters uh, somewhere between 25 and 45 in that range i think is ideal depending on how much food you're taking a picture of if it's like one dish you can probably get away with a 25 and if it's uh say a whole table you know uh you could do 25 but i think it looks better if you step back even further and use a 45 and if you can, you know, use an extension arm like the one video I did review on that extension arm and try and get a top down view if you can. Uh, or use a tilt shift lens, uh, which, you know, uh, changes the plane of focus. You know, these, these, are all, these are all really interesting ways, I think, or best ways to capture food photography. Uh, you, know, you know who's really good at food photography is that guy on Tin House Studio. I guarantee you he'll have a video on it. You know, you should try, I, I, I can't recall one specifically, but he's a hardcore, like high-end food photographer. And, but I don't know if, he, yeah, see if he has any videos on that and what focal lengths he uses. You'll have to convert a lot of stuff because he was using a full frame camera or medium format camera. So you might have to convert the focal lengths down to whatever format you're using, which I assume is, you know, micro four thirds. But uh, to me, I think that, that that is the look that i like it's when i'm shooting at 25 millimeters to 45 on micro four thirds uh and between 50 and 85 on full frame uh 50 millimeter 85 on full frame and just get enough distance for that but like i said you know what do i know i'm not a food photographer but when i was taking pictures of some food uh that's what I was comfortable. Like, I think the, the, uh, if you look at the thumbnail of this particular live stream, I did a flat lay of the pen F and I believe that was used. I was using a 25 millimeter lens, my EM five Mark two, three with the 25 millimeter lens to capture that image. And I really liked the square format and I liked the, the, the angle of view that I got <clears throat> because think about it. If you get too close to, let's say I got these two things, right? I have to drink so much water and juice. I try not to drink juices, but my mom, she bought me this pomegranate juice. I don't know why. I told her not to buy me juices. So I mix it with water. I try to dilute it as much as I can. But you got these two things sitting on the table. And you get too close, you're just going to see the insides of you're just going to see the insides of the bottles because you're too close, right? But if you get a little bit longer focal length, you can get up higher and you can see more of the top of the bottles and all the way around the bottle, more three-dimensional versus a super wide angle that you bring in close. You're only going to see one side of the bottle. And the same thing applies to food, right? You're only going to see one side of things and it's not going to look right. So that, that's that's why I was saying use a longer focal length so you can bring the lens back a little further and you can see more sides or more dimensions of the foods and things on the table. And then Tom Pitcock in Yorkshire, England wins the Amsterdam. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about, but that's cool. It's one something. And Tin House is cool. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He's a cool guy. I like him a lot. And then Lasivin says, I've tried the OM workspace again. Notice it's AI noise and new update. Any comments? Um, it works fine. It only works with certain cameras, the AI noise reduction. And uh, uh, 
But I like using OM Workspace time to time, specifically for the art access to the art filters and the color wheel. <clears throat> but more so for the art filters, I like OM Workspace. The only challenge I have with OM Workspace is that you can't do local adjustments. Uh, you know, you can't like brush in something and make it a little brighter if you want to. So, or do gradients and radial filters. I do a lot of that in my post processing. So, excuse me, that's the only limitation to Workspace. But otherwise, it's a perfectly fine editor and it does everything. And it's a little slow, but you know, it's free, right? So. And then uh, at least once a month, I shoot only black and white. Even if things I know I'll process in color, it helps me concentrate on contrast, shadows, light when I shoot color. Yeah, so same thing, right? It, it's, I, you know, it's not just me, right? But it's, I think it does benefit your color photography when you're shooting in black and white as well. If you go into it with that mindset, right? Don't think of black and white separate from color photography. They're really the same thing. You're looking for lights and shadows and tones right? Whether it's color or black and white, but black and white is like another tool for you to help you in your color photography as well and vice versa. Yeah, Robin does some really good food images. He'd be a good person to ask what he does. I, I don't really do much food photography. And then, sorry if I missed this before, but any comments on the recent? Yeah, we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. Uh, and I have a community post, but just to sum it up, uh, it resets the time and date and all your custom settings. So make sure you save your custom settings to your phone app or to your computer so that you can reload them later. And then apparently it doesn't recall everything either, right? There's some changes. Uh, and then the other thing is some are reporting much better autofocus with bird detect at least. So it seems like even though it wasn't listed as one of the uh, benefits or improvements, it is, but remains to be seen. And I'm trying to come up with, uh, I'm not going to update yet. I'm going to wait a little bit until I get some time to do a testing methodology and then see if I can quantify any differences in the autofocus. And Darko says, I bought the 80 to 400 AFS. ED, oh yeah, okay, Nikkor, and traded my 150 to 600 Sigma using it on the Z50. I'm getting crisper shots. I've heard really good things about the 80 to 400. I think it's an 80 to 300, isn't it? The 70 to 300 Nikkor VR is supposed to be really good. Um, I'm not familiar with the 80 to 400, but I, I think the 70 to 300 Nikkor VR is supposed to be really amazing. But that's good, yeah. And it's a lot lighter and smaller too, right? <laughs> and John says, I also do cycle racing. Well done, Tim Paddock. Awesome. Oh, so we're talking about like bicycle racing. Interesting. And David says, beware FAE. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. I really appreciate everyone coming in today and hanging out with me. I feel so much better. So thank you for being here for me. And, and hopefully I was there for you a little bit as well and, and helping as much as I can. Um, not to worry, I'm not going anywhere. For those of you that were on Facebook and saw that post where you're worried if I was going away from Olympus or OM systems, like I said, it's, it's more to do with I'm dealing with some other issues in, in real life and not photography. Uh, and uh, I will be back on Friday with Emily Talpin, okay, Friday evening, uh, USA time, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so definitely come there, and I'd love to see you all there as well, too. So uh, you guys have a great rest of your weekend, and I will see you again soon.